Double Feature. Uh, joining me is famous Chicago musician Michael Kester. Oh yeah. Now uh, people know for a fact that you are the lead singer of uh, Glitter Mouse. Anybody listening in Chicago is well aware of that. Yeah, that's probably true. Also, everybody listening not in Chicago probably also aware of that too. <laughs> talk about it on the show. But you have another band out yeah. there. Two of the guys from Glitter Mouse and I have this really. It's it's supposed to be really fucked up, and it's basically the goal is to alienate the audience. Okay, great. It's we're called Stepfather Gets Mohawk. So this is an an in thing you're letting people on our show know about. Yeah, the Stepfather Gets Mohawk audience doesn't get to know that they're being alienated, right? Or is it that obvious? It's I don't know if it's that obvious. It's weird. It's 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 uncomfortable for the audience, and it's really fun to be on stage. Um, it, it's kind of a way for me to cope with my uh my I have performance anxiety. Oh, I, just, I would have no idea about that. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> and so I invented a band where I get to make everybody feel more uncomfortable than me. That's beautiful. Man, especially on this show, you are not the one with performance <laughs> anxiety. That's funny. Uh, look up Stepfather Gets Mohawk if for no other reason than the really hot cover you have. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably supposed to be dirtier than hot, but I just find it incredibly erotic. It's fine. Um, on Double Feature today, we're doing two movies. We are. The eroticism of said movies is debatable, I would say, in both accounts, actually. Wow, yes. We're doing a sort of not really musicals that kind of have songs in them and such. Yeah, we're going to do Dancer in the Dark and Purple Rain. What are the respective artists that we may be highlighting? Okay, so I'm just going to say this one time. So uh, Dancer in the Dark features an artist from Iceland, and as a uh, the guy, one of the guys who is both in Glitter Mouse and Stepfather Gets Mohawk, you and I both know him as Rob. Um, I know him as star of the short film I Am Anna. Right. Rob. Yeah. He's from Iceland. And he will rally behind me in saying that it's not pronounced Bjork. Oh, really? It's pronounced Bjork. Wow. Um, My whole world has been turned upside down. I just wanted to say that at the beginning of the show so that from this point on, when you and I refer to her as Bjork because it's more comfortable, <laughs> we're just uh, sure. we're just making a mistake. We're preventing emails from flooding in from Iceland. So uh, that's great. Today's artists are Bjork and Prince. So Prince, I can keep pronouncing that way, or do I have to make a joke about symbols or something? No, in Iceland, Prince is still Prince. And we're gonna fucking spoil the movies. So goddamn it, if you haven't seen them. Well, they're emotional, yes, and you should skip the ones you haven't seen because we we have to talk about the emotional parts. Use chapters is what I was getting at. Use chapters or just fucking stop listening to the show forever, or don't care about spoilers. One of those options is for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dancer in the Dark is a little more recent than I thought. It's from 2000, and uh, I'm amazed. I, I bring up the time it was created. Because that was, uh, you know, 2000 was a year that I was alive on planet Earth. Sure. It was also a year that I listened to Bjork. Uh-huh. I don't know how the fuck I have never seen this movie. <laughs> um, the reason I don't know how I haven't seen it is not so much that I didn't know about it. Because I definitely knew about Dancer in the Dark. Sure. It's not even the first Lars von Trier movie I've seen, which is the weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. But if you just, you know, elevator pitch this movie to me as Lars von Trier movie with Bjork... Yeah. Or either of those things, really. If you just said, hey, watch this Lars von Trier movie or watch this Bjork movie, if I had actually spent five minutes to think about what that experience would be like, sure, I would have seen it immediately. What right. is wrong with me? Yeah. Bjork is a lot of things, but above all, she is odd. Yes. And should have cameras pointed at her. Uh huh. As an odd individual, I think that's what you want to do. You know, seeing her on that little stage as the movie opens just being weird yeah in seemingly a less controlled environment than you know when she's on an actual stage on a musical stage or in a video mm -hmm. it's a very controlled environment sure. that's how she wants to be perceived right as a musician let's say yeah you're not seeing her with the makeup off right you know you're not seeing her out of costume right and then seeing her in this movie 
which is very handheld and stylistically feels very documentary style, Mm -hmm. that has my attention immediately. Even before she opens her mouth, just to study this weird entity and go, what what is she doing? How does she act when she, you know, Uh doesn't, I want to say doesn't have the cameras pointed at her, but she does. And then on top of that, there's this other weird thing that happens that we haven't really talked about in music. But you have a strange relationship with a singer because, you know, you've listened to their album over and over. You know their voice. Mm -hmm. You have absolutely got what they sound like. And then there's their speaking voice, which for most musicians, you don't know what that sounds like. Right. And someone's speaking voice is, that's usually the first thing you know about them. When you meet somebody, you guys talk, you know their speaking voice. It's a very obvious familiar elements of someone's persona Mm -hmm. and you don't understand it with singers you don't you know you have no idea what it sounds like bjork has such a distinct singing voice that hearing her speak yeah rather than sing is this kind of it's really eye-opening it's like the first time i heard trent reznor talk you know yeah after listening to 20 some albums and then finally hearing an interview, don't know how that took so long, just like I don't know how Dance in the Dark took so long, and going, oh, wow, that's what he sounds like? There's just something very odd about it. Mm-hmm. But this is also a Lars von Trier movie. Sure. And I think the most famous thing about this particular Lars von Trier movie is the impossibly tense strain between von Trier and Bjork. Sure. Bjork uh, left the set for days during the filming of this. That doesn't surprise me. It's really well known, especially because she never really acted after this. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's had a couple little parts here and there. But, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff about, oh, Lars von Trier caused her to never act again, or she didn't, you know, she made an exception to her no acting rule to act for von Trier. So it's a really interesting dynamic already. But uh, there was also this long-standing thing I've heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but that she would start filming every day by, uh, I think the line is, Mr. Trier, I despise you. And then she would spit in his face. Wow. And that's how they would begin their, yeah, their filming. It's just a crazy, crazy thing. There were fights about, you know, her wanting a happier ending or something more upbeat. A lot of things kind of changed from the original concepts being less tap dancing oriented and more musical you don't really know i mean whose decisions those were but knowing that bjork wrote the music sure and knowing what early bjork sounds like sure it's a lot more show tuney yeah well it's also really interesting that that kind of conflict and struggle ended up being a part of the film outside of the film because that's a lot of the struggle that goes on within the film too is yeah right is um it feels very much like Selma's character is struggling in a world that isn't the world she wishes it was. Right. right. Uh, and so to put that into uh, a more real perspective, that's Bjork struggling in a film that isn't the film she wishes it was. Well, and it's hard to say. I mean, is Von Trier the one causing the conflict? Is Bjork causing the conflict? Sure. Both notorious, huge personalities just sure. maybe clashing. It's funny you mentioned that because The scenes where they're in the theater and there's the guy in front Uh that's giving him a hard time. Yeah. I guess that was a part that Von Trier originally intended to play himself, but he was so worried because of all the conflict and just the tense nature on set. It would just explode. Yeah, absolutely. When he was saying that kind of stuff. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, Von Trier is somebody that as we move down our our diagram of obscure film Mm -hmm. that I'm... uh, I'm just really invested in in covering more of his stuff, so I won't talk about him a lot here. But I think um, the biggest thing, direction-wise and style-wise, is that it's mostly handheld, that it feels like a documentary. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's without actually invoking documentary. We're not doing Cannibal Holocaust. Right. We don't have the, uh, the last exorcism kind of asides. Sure. This isn't a crew shows up to film Bjork's conflict. Right. That's just the style that we chose to film this in. And it makes it feel very guerrilla cinema, very, you know, the shots are all incredibly close to the actors. The camera's in very, very close proximity. 
sometimes you can only get the shot from the vantage point of the only spot the camera operator would fit in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, they clearly chose these locations. And instead of building big elaborate sets where you can fit a a huge camera rig and all these people in, it kind of looks like, oh, we have a tiny room we're shooting in. One guy can stand over there with the camera and that's about all we can get. Sure. You know, so you see these strange vantage points. They're frequently shooting these close-ups of the actors from just behind the actors. Yeah. So you get this portion that's, it's not the back of their head, but it is kind of this, uh, I don't know, it's just a, a really strange angle that you wouldn't normally shoot people in. Right. You also get a lot more close-ups, uh, maybe because of that, or maybe that was a really intentional choice, but mm-hmm. it seems like we spend a lot of the movie focused right on people's faces. Yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe it's an obvious thing, but that does really draw you into the drama of a movie. Oh, yeah. Now, you ask yourself a question about style when you see something really distinct. Why do that? What's the idea there? Is it, especially with handheld movies, we go, well, with Cloverfield, that was part of why do the movie at all. Sure. Almost as a plot point. Uh, REC, I thought about that a lot, too. Even movies like the Gus Van Sant films, where we have a lot of wide shots or a lot of static shots, what is the director trying to invoke? And I'm not sure, besides emotion and drama, that I had a really clear go-to until the scene with the box to the head. Yeah. And that's suddenly where I go, oh, this is the most uncomfortable place to put me. Uh It is the place that I don't want to be, you know, feeling like I'm witnessing a human even the gunshots sure they're not you know theatrically amped gunshots they're little pops they sound like Mm -hmm. what it would sound like if you fired a gun and you were filming you know with a little home dv camera sure all right so before box to the head totally puts me off on a a tangent um other actors yeah in this movie peter stormare yeah peter stormare just showing up everywhere yeah we get peter stormare there's there's a I, I i can't think of the guy's name i'm sure you uh bill is david morse that, who is on 12 that's monkeys right. yeah yeah and i'll point you to say about bill too but i also want to give uh udo kier more screen time on oh, our yeah. show today than he had in the movie sure please filmmakers put him in everything put him in every fucking movie have you ever been watching a movie and Udo Kier showed up and you went, ah, oh, God damn it, this guy, I don't want him to be in this movie. No. That's never happened, ever. It doesn't No happen. one has ever said that. Put him in all movies. He would make everything better. You know what's interesting to me about the other cast members of this film? Um, mm-hmm. Peter Stormer and David Morse come to mind specifically because uh, they have these duets yeah. with Selma, which... Sure. It's really interesting to to see this juxtaposition specifically let's 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 base this strongly on Peter Stormare because mm-hmm. it's no secret that I love Peter Stormare and that I think he's a fantastic performer. Sure. So you have somebody like Peter Stormare who is playing Jeff, who's a really understated character especially for him. And that's put up against Bjork who's never acted before. Right. Uh, and she's playing this this big moving character who who's got a lot of motion and a lot of uh you know every scene she's in she's moving around dancing around the frame even when she's not actually singing right and that's put up against these musical numbers where peter stormare has to keep up yeah with bjork's vocal lines and if ever there were a moment <laughs> that you could praise bjork for having this powerhouse in her lungs it's when David Morse, or Peter Stormare, or a- any of the actors who, with the exception of perhaps Aldrich Novi, uh-huh. <laughs> who share a duet right. with, with Bjork, they're kind of talk singing their lines. They're, they're getting through the notes. Sure. And then Bjork explodes on the following right, line. Right, right. It's really powerful within the film for me because as much as this film is about the world beating the shit out of Selma, uh-huh. uh, out of Selma being this pure and good person and the world just beating the shit out of her. Uh, the line comes, she's the line is uh, in the film where someone says she's strong. She's very strong. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that comes through the best when she's singing opposite these real world people. Does sure. that make sense? Yeah, I have. So I'm, I'm, 
Perhaps I'm being a little too quiet. I have a bomb to drop on you. Oh, yeah. And I was going to, I was just going to kind of throw this in at the end because I, uh-huh. it just blows my mind and I have trouble um, comprehending it. Peter Stormare's voice is dubbed for the, uh, the song for uh, I've Seen It All. Uh huh. I didn't know if you'd know about this prior to us talking about it or not. I was actually hoping maybe you'd have an answer for me. I didn't but- know who dubbed his singing voice. What I did know is that on the uh, actual soundtrack, there's a different vocalist. Yeah, so the voice is done by Tom York. On the actual soundtrack? Well, so this is the crazy thing, right? Because I just watched the movie. You just watched the movie. That's not Tom York, no, right? No, that's not Tom York. But I looked it up right before we did the show, and it's the only version I can find I'm not sure because I, you know, I'm watching videos. Sure. I don't know if it's uh, just the sound. You know, again, a simple internet search sure. would would reveal this information. Uh-huh. But I'm gonna enjoy this brief moment where we don't know if that's Tom York <laughs> in the film. Sure. Ah, because God, that would be bizarre. It does not sound like Tom. You know who it sounds like is Peter Stormare. It sounds a lot like so, Peter Stormare. Right. So that's either Tom York doing a really good Peter Stormare, <laughs> or uh, it's just Peter Stormare, and Tom York does it for the soundtrack. Sure. Uh, that's probably what's happening. And if we just you know use the internet, we would have that answer. But that's for the audience. This is not a an all inclusive bottle of information. <laughs> this is two people just saw a film and want to know what the fuck is happening. So uh, use the internet. By the way. Bjork Unsolved Mysteries, let's just add it to that, because I still don't know about Army of Me, back from Sucker Punch. Sure. People were supposed to write in and give us answers uh, 17 years ago, and no one has said anything. Come on, guys. Bjork aficionados listening to The Dancer in the Dark show, don't write in about Tom York. I don't care. I'll look it up later. Write in about uh, Army of Me. Go listen to the Sucker Punch show. I still want my fucking answer. (laughs) David Morse's part, though. Bill, who I just believe, again totally uh duped all the money is gone Mm -hmm. she gets home none of the money's there and then she shows up at his place and is immediately accused of infidelity Uh uh-huh now this looks pretty bad for bill oh yeah it kind of looks like he stole all her money and then made up a lie about yeah about them to his wife but she goes upstairs and so i'm pissed at bill right i think he's a terrible rotten person and then bill looks at her and goes you know again speaking uh Speaking as they did before, like they're in on this together. They're, this is a little secret they share. Uh-huh. He lets down his guard and he goes, yeah, well, you know, I, uh, I had to take the money because I lied to my wife. It was all I could think about. And, you know, I, I just want to come clean to you. I told her that, uh, you know, that you invited me in for a bout sure. of infidelity. And she goes, yeah, I, I already knew that. Bill has about the best fucking excuse he could have. Uh He basically goes, I was caught in a lie and I'm sorry that I borrowed your money, but I'm just using it as a prop. And all I could think to tell my wife is that, you know, you Uh tried to have sex with me. And so I actually start believing him again because I'm a fucking sucker. Sure. And it's not until he goes, well, I'm taking the money. You can't have this for a month. Yeah. And then points the gun at her. And then I feel betrayed. Yeah. You know, he's a, he's a desperate man and he's a liar. If we can look at this skeptically for a moment. Sure. I need to stop just going, all human beings are good and no one would ever lie to you ever. You know what's interesting uh, that you say that right now is that recently there's a list on the internet. Um, it's something like maybe 19. It's either 19 or 25 or 27. One of those arbitrary numbered lists. Sure, great. But basically, it's films that will make you give up on humanity. <laughs> sure. Uh, Dancer in the Dark is, it's definitely within the top 10 or 20. Sure. And I think Bill is the driving force behind why you might give up on humanity. Because Selma is innocent. She embodies general innocence and honesty and benevolence. And while the world does kind of rip her apart, she's going blind. That's no one's fault. She loses her job. That's totally understandable. She's a liability and it's dangerous for her. Bill is kind of the only person who straight up ruins her life. Everything that's amounting to the horrible life that Selma is going to end up having led is on the shoulders of Bill to a point where, I mean, and I agree with you, 
I want him to be an okay guy yeah. up until the moment he pulls a gun on her. Sure, and sure. That's where he's crossed the line into violence. Well, and and I just want, I just, I don't understand why it, it becomes the moment that I never understand in in human beings where suddenly your life is more important than another individual's life. Right. Because you're in power. Sure. I mean, I can totally understand weighing options. I've been playing Walking Dead the game. I mean, I know weighing the <laughs> right. options of human life. Sure. What I don't understand is because you're in power, you decide you're the one who matters. Sure. Well, it's self-preservation. I mean, that's certainly... An, sure. You know, it's hard. This is something that comes up all the time. Our conflict of skepticism and humanism. Yes. That are often at odds with each other. And I mean, not really. You find so many uh, science enthusiasts who are also humanists. You find many, many atheists who are also humanists. Those Venn diagrams overlap quite a bit. But the idea of thinking critically, I often find myself you know, in conflict with wanting to believe in people. Right. And you have to, I mean, people don't get a free pass. You should be skeptical of the motivations of human beings as well. I'm not quite sure in my own life yet how to how to parse those things, but I do know looking at Bill, we should be suspicious for the following reasons. He is a desperate man and he is a liar. Yes. And those are all we know about Bill. Uh-huh. And he wears a police uniform. So, you know, there is that thing in the back of our head that goes, oh, he's a cop. He's a, an icon of the law. But of course, he's a cop in a film, which means he's the bad guy. Uh-huh. So, you know, he's, uh, he's hard up for money. We have that fact. And he's been lying to his wife this entire time. Sure. Now, not all liars are bad people, but this is certainly a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. A desperate man who we know has no trouble lying to the people who should be closest to him. Sure. But also, and I mean, if we're going to be objective, if I could speak out of the, um, out of the emotional theme of the film a little bit, when... Bjork smashes his head in with the box. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, yeah, she should go to, you know, go to jail. And I wouldn't say get the death penalty, but life in prison. There is a point there where, you know, and I don't want to talk about it too much because thematically the film is, that's not what it's playing into. It's saying this is a mercy killing. And look, here's a person who is honest and does good things and just gets destroyed by society. Mm -hmm. But if we're just going to play things by the facts here. I don't want to be the coldest person to ever talk about Dancer in the Dark, but uh, she did murder a man. Yeah, she did. But again, now we're going to start getting into the difficult decision of she didn't intend to shoot him. She shot him in the stomach, which I've seen enough war movies to know that's the most painful way to die. Uh, okay. And All right. he I did see what you're ask her to kill him. Right. Which, if killing is murder, then she murdered him. But if there is any gray area with euthanasia... Sure. Perhaps. All right. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. That brings us to prison, no matter how you slice it. (laughs) We end up in jail. We have a uh, we have a John Waters s <laughs> we have a John Waters s court scene where Aldrich Novi plays John Waters. Right. Then uh, then it's straight to the the Green Mile. And the court is not devoid of music either. No, we have. Uh, I mean, I'm not really a musicals person, but God, do I light up the first time when the factory is creating this industrial show tune, uh-huh. and then Bjork just fucking goes at it. I mean, I didn't an- I didn't know that about Dancer in the Dark. I didn't anticipate that. Yeah. I never thought that I would look at something that might be considered a musical and go, oh yeah, top 10, maybe top five material. Uh But I'm just fucking in love with this movie. I really am. I was so astonished by it. You know, breaking into that first, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you about it. It's machines making music. Sure. Let's, Let's also be really straight there. Yeah, it's a little bit musical, but it's also the perfect match of she works in a factory, so the beats are made by machines. Literally industrial music. Exactly, exactly. When I say to people, I kind of like industrial, I guess. If all music was made by machines, I mean, I would just be in, it it would be an ideal world for me, utopia. Mm -hmm. She works next to this machine, which I think is supposed to terrify you, right? It scares the hell out of me. Anything that crushes anything scares me. Right, right. Okay, I didn't know if that was supposed to be tense or if I'm being irrational for going, you're going to lose a limb in the first 20 minutes of this movie. It's just going to happen. Uh, But these musical numbers, she spends the whole movie 
retreating flawlessly to music. It is her character. Right. She has a hard time and she daydreams. And every single time she daydreams and has one of these musical pieces, she comes back with this huge smile on her face. Nothing, no matter how heavy, brings her down. It works literally 100% of the time. And then they put her in isolation. Yeah. It's just such a gut punch. I mean, that's one of those, you just get emotionally checked at that point in the movie. It's, uh, oh yeah, all those retreats, that whole, you know, world's got you down, but don't worry, you'll always have a tune. Mm-hmm. They go, oh yeah, well, actually not here. We, we don't have tunes either. So there's, <laughs> uh, it turns out there's nothing for you. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just chilling here for a couple of days, uh, then we're going to hang you. And at the end of that, we come to the moment of 107 steps. Mm-hmm. And that is probably, uh, I mean, I, I think outside from the box scene, yeah. which just, you know, appeals to the part of me that every other movie we do appeals to, <laughs> uh, man, 107 steps is just, it's hard. And watching her be blissful, I don't know if that's, you know, you get that whispering each step one after another. Sure. And seeing her just rock out. There's something bittersweet about it. Yeah. It's really, I mean, maybe not. There should be something bittersweet about it, but seeing how jubilant she is and that mm-hmm. not being sweet at all, it just being, yeah, lady, you're going to die. Stop dancing around. I just, it should be good that she's having this last moment to enjoy herself. But God, it's just fucking rough. So I want to ask a dangerous question here. Okay. I really love this film. I think everything it does is great. Uh huh. And uh, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't be happier with it. But the question I want to ask is: Is there a moral tale here? I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing the film because I'm certainly not. But I'm curious what the story's objective is. Why tell the story? I don't know if morality actually plays in. I think the notion of the entire film plays off the title. Mm -hmm. And um, there's the obvious, the obvious dark being blindness. Sure. But I don't think that that's really what the film is saying. I think that the film is more about um, the dark being the dismal nature of the film. Sure. I mean, she works in a factory. She's broke. Her son is going blind. She can't afford to give him anything. She lives in a coach house. She can't make time in she right. can't make time in her life for friends nor relationships. She has to take a second job. She's losing her eyesight. She goes to prison and gets the death penalty. The only joy in her entire life comes from her old country because she moved to America on a whim that ended up playing false. If you want to talk about somebody who's dancing amidst all of that. Sure. I think that person is the one who sings about how she's definitely not going to die because <laughs> right. there's not a big dance number with the noose around her neck. I suppose this is why I even wanted to look at, is it justified that she uh, is imprisoned for smashing Bill's head in? Mm-hmm. The only reason to even consider that, because it's obviously not what the movie's getting at, is it feeds into my later question of... What is the movie trying to tell us? I know I don't trust Bill. Is the movie trying to say, don't mercy kill people? I mean, clearly not. So I wonder about the choice to tell this story. Does it make it, I mean, it it sounds like from what you're saying that you would guess it's more a character piece, Mm -hmm. more looking at here's how someone reacts to literally the worst situation that could ever possibly arise. Well, I think think it's one of those stories that, you know, we get every now and again that's even if you do everything right, that doesn't mean everything's going to work out. Sure. Yeah. And the movie certainly, it doesn't have to deliver any kind of message. Right. I mean, that's not something I feel like is a requirement. But when I finish this movie, not thinking about that at all, and I go, wow, that was a really fucking great movie, a wonderful way to linger on something like that even longer is to go, what questions does Dancer in the Dark answer? What is it, you know, I'm Lars von Trier. I go, my passion is to make this movie. Why is that? Yeah, I think, I think for me, it comes down to the notion that there are no musicals with, with sad endings and sad stories. <laughs> sure, well, that's enough to justify it right there. Um, and I think it's, 
this is this is a real world musical in in one sense of doing a real world musical. Yeah, so something to pause on and think about a little bit more in the future. I know this is a, a theme of several Lars von Trier movies. So I don't know, maybe I kind of want to keep that in our minds to to set it up a little more for other things. But he's done, I want to say it's a whole trilogy of movies where characters really experience no growth. They sort of uh, remain naive through the whole movie. Mm -hmm. We see this movie here. That's a really, uh, really interesting thing about this character is that this is a stubborn, silly woman, and she remains silly like that until death. Mm -hmm. You know, she uh, she's kind of I don't want to say blissfully ignorant. She definitely gets riled up about things, specifically her son, but she's able to retreat to song. And a lot of times that retreat is enough for her that she can't be bothered. You know, when the decision comes between looking at surgery or paying for her lawyer, mm -hmm. paying for her lawyer isn't the end of the game. She can pay for her lawyer and then try and exhaust other options. Right. But when she weighs the other side, she goes, or I could pay for the surgery and, you know, I'll have a little song before I die. Mm -hmm. That makes that decision uh, easy for her. It's something she barely even thinks about. Mm -hmm. And... That uh, kind of naivety about the gravity of the world around her, I feel like that's probably going to be a focus in some of the other Lars von Trier stuff we'll eventually see. So if you want to go from something where you're talking about the naivety of the world and take it to its most stark contrast, I think the only option is to talk about Prince. The cold, harsh realities of the music club scene. Well, and it's not even that. I mean, Prince is a human being. I don't know how, how familiar you are with Prince, Eric. I've had some conversations in, uh, in preparation for this. I know a lot of Prince fans. So Prince has both invented the internet and declared it over. Sure. Prince is a Jehovah's Witness. He owns no less than three watchtowers. He has a replica arena in his backyard so that he can rehearse his stage shows i mean he lives in minnesota born and raised that's where all of purple rain takes place is uh just in and outside minneapolis but prince first and foremost there's all this lore that surrounds prince because he's mysterious and sexual and racially diverse sure but the one thing that i can say for certain about prince is that he is the most deliberate human being that I think exists on planet Earth. Deliberate's an odd, uh, odd choice for such a bizarre person. I think every decision he makes, he makes knowing that he is correct. Even if he's wrong, <laughs> he knows he's right. Well, that's he the knows. other thing I really like about Prince as a character, is how often he's wrong, but acts as if that couldn't even possibly be an option. Yeah. I mean, the amount of sexism loaded into this movie sure. that is just played off like, well, of course I'm like that. That's just the world. That's how everything is. Yeah. And I, I'm told that about Prince in general, that he is just flagrantly sexist. And you have mm -hmm. to look at that as, you know, that is part of a character, whether he knows it's a character sure. or not. But to take, to take Prince and take something like Purple Rain, I think, is a perfect example of all of this because... Mm -hmm. Prince uh, came up with the idea for Purple Rain, the, the story, and basically, you know, just to do a movie about himself and his music. Sure. And he pitched it to, you know, a couple studios back in the 80s. And every single studio kind of went, this is a terrible idea. This is, this is suicide for any money we pour into it. And Prince goes, no, no, no. I got my manager. He's going to direct it. Right. I'm going to star in it. I'm going to do all the music. I got, he had a bunch of actresses lined up to play Apollonia's part. Mm -hmm. That all kind of the one I don't remember her name, but she was in a band that broke up. So he decided oh, not yeah, to yeah, use yeah. her. Right. Uh, and he had Morris Day in the time, which was just another band he was in. Sure. Can we talk about the time for a second? <laughs> Would you let's, like to wait on that? Let's 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 get back to the time. It's not time yet. Wow. But he he pitches this whole idea for Purple Rain, which I think you and I can both agree sitting here in 2013 that uh, looking back at it. The notion for Purple Rain is a terrible idea. <laughs> it's like, well, it reminds me a lot of, you know, the the origins of uh, music videos have been sure. much talked about as commercial pieces. Sure. They were uh, short videos of single songs of the band playing 
to give labels and promoters and and so forth an idea of what this band looks like, what their thing is. Sure. And then MTV came around and just started playing these commercials for bands, which I think MTV has been true to itself for a long time. People complain about, oh, I stopped watching when they stopped playing music videos. But MTV has always just been a channel to air commercials, which I think they've uh-huh. they've held true to their origins. But that's kind of... I mean, that's Purple Rain. We're sure. extending that idea sure. even further. And uh, so eventually the studio agreed, uh, for, by some divine providence perhaps, <laughs> Jehovah opened her arms wow. and allowed Warner Brothers to produce Purple Rain. And mm, I'm going to go with not any of that. <laughs> and Prince was right. It was a huge commercial success. Terribly, terribly successful. Prince earned an Academy Award Wow, I didn't know any of that. I thought cult hit and that was no, the end it, of it. I mean, we're talking this isn't this isn't Ghostbusters. This was successful <laughs> when it came out. Oh, uh, we're in another year. You can't keep getting hate mail for the same stuff <laughs> from last year. We have to find new things. So, yeah, Purple Rain is this bizarre little film uh and it packs a lot of heat for a little film. Prince is no slouch when he's on the screen. Most of the characters, with the exception of Prince, play themselves. Right. Are you aware of this? Sure. Prince plays the kid. Right. Everybody else. Although he is in the same band he was right. in back yeah. then. Isn't that the yes. case? And now I think is a great time to talk about Morris Day and Jerome <laughs> and the rest of the time. I wish the time was the, the antagonist, the foil in every movie. I love the notion of Morris Day and the time is the villain. I know. Well, this is also what I'm talking about with the sexism. It's not Prince is a sexist character in a totally normal universe. It's Prince is a sexist character in the real universe and thusly creates a movie where all people are sexist yeah. and no one questions it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the time maybe slightly more sexist. Uh Prince is like fun sexist on the, you know, on the lake, throw you in, make you take your top off. Uh Fun, harmless sexism in his mind. Whereas the time is like throw a woman in a dumpster. In a dumpster, yeah. In Prince's world, sexism is like, no, 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 I didn't throw her in a dumpster. It's not sexist. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, you want to make Prince seem like just your normal average guy, just the one the viewer is going to identify with. (laughs) He's just a kid trying to make it. You put him next to the time. Yeah. I mean, I think about Prince and I think like, you know, showboaty, got that funk thing going on, very stylized, Uh uh, very sexual performance. Sure. And then, you know, the time comes out and I mean, brings a mirror when he walks out of his limo, you know, mirror on stage, just constantly checking his hair. I mean, it's a caricature of a caricature. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty far out there. It's great. And it's weird because if you look at the beginnings of this film, Prince was talking about how Purple Rain was supposed to be a lot darker than it ended up being. Oh, really? So you have to wonder where the time would have been in a much darker <laughs> film. <laughs> sure. Um, I would love to see a dark film with the time. Are they? Do they still do things? Oh, Can yeah. I? They still perform. Oh, man. Uh, oh, this is great. The thing about purple rain and and i did i did kind of mention this when i eventually convinced you to let me get purple rain on double feature this is a conversation we've been having for a long time yeah is that purple rain uh i i i often said it's kind of heavy (laughs) sure and i do admit that a lot of the film seems like woo, we're having fun we're playing at first (laughs) avenue and Right. And Prince is, you know, rocking the fuck out and everybody's hating it until he plays Purple Rain, <laughs> which didn't even, it didn't even chart number one on the uh, Billboard charts. Sure. But it makes people cry. Sure. Right on. Which is so funny compared to Dancer in the Dark. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, so true. The, the, my reaction to Dancer in the Dark was, you know, sometimes you have a, a movie, like it gets under your skin and you have a nice uh-huh. slow cry. Dance in the Dark was more like you choke on a piece of food. Yeah. You know, and tears just spew out of your eyes and right. splash against your screen. Right. And then Purple, you know, Dancer in the Dark does that, says nothing about it. Purple Rain comes up and it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to play Purple Rain. You're going to cry. Yeah. Smooth. <gasps> but the film does touch on some fairly heavy things with abuse. And I think that's probably where a lot of the expansion would have been in a darker Purple Rain. Yeah, okay, I could see that. Um, the stuff we were just talking about with uh, Rebel Without a Cause. Right, exactly. And I think, uh, I think that while Purple Rain seems pretty bubblegum through the entire thing, we get uh, 
shameless performances of print. There's there's a scene, I think, is it the scene toward the end of the film where the last 15 minutes is Prince playing three songs back to back on stage? With his uh, fancy guitar sure. that Apollonia right. uh, bought him. I love that. Buys him a guitar, he socks her in the face. <laughs> The film, the film eventually, uh, it just, it just turns into a Prince in the Revolution show. Yeah. But before that, we get this really dark moment with, with his father, with the kid's father, uh, having beaten his mother and some, some, you know, suicide attempts. Right. And it, the eponymous song Purple Rain represents something in the film that most of the other songs don't. Songs like Darling Nikki and Let's Go Crazy are fun party songs and, you know, they will go on to be covered by the Foo Fighters and what the fuck. Ever. I don't know, man. I think Darling Nikki even has its dark points. In it the, does. In the film. I mean, it's it's having a little fun, but it's almost like a, um, it's like a retribution. Sure. It's like a spiteful. Sure. Fuck you. Jab in the face. Right. With your crotch. <laughs> Darling Nikki being one of the only Prince songs uh, I knew before seeing the movie. It almost feels made for the film. Sure. You know, it suddenly the awkward bits of air in that song where it just kind of drops right. out and nothing's happening and there's a snare. Snare. Yeah. It makes sense uh, seeing it with the, the visual elements that are there. Sure. Do you know Rebecca Romaine did a cover of Darling Nikki for some kind of goth I tribute album? I didn't know that. Prince, no. uh, Prince has to be one of the most covered artists of all time. Oh, yeah. And also one of the most jealous artist to be covered oh really yeah he he gets he's very very property oriented so if you cover his music sure. he's one of the few artists that if you cover his music live he will try to get royalties from you sure right uh, he's also one of those artists who if he covers another band live and he finds a video of it on youtube he will force it to be taken down oh wow he covered creep a couple years ago at coachella the uh radiohead song speaking of tom york and any video of it on the internet was immediately stricken down so much so that Radiohead got angry because they felt like he was <laughs> taking property of their own music. Right. Wow. How and about that? I think you're completely right. I think Darling Nikki is one of the moments where he's, he's shouting at Apollonia about his heart being broken. But right. you take the song Purple Rain and it has the origin of his father had written part of it and he took it and turned it into this emotional ballad about just the downfall of the i mean it's basically the downfall of the american child mm. and it's it's about how he just wanted to have this romantic moment and he turns the desire to have this romantic moment into the most romantic moment in the film sure and i don't mean romantic in the boy and a girl and the penis and the vagina right i right. mean you know it's this this moment where everybody is united in the same feeling I think that that is what I take away most from Purple Rain is this overarching, you watch Purple Rain in an audience of a hundred people, or you watch Purple Rain with one other person, and there is never a point where the two of you are thinking different things. Sure. The film, by being so heavily musical and so Prince-oriented, makes it incredibly relatable the whole time yeah and when prince is having fun you're having fun and when prince's heart is broken your sure. heart is broken sure and when morris day and jerome are are throwing women in dumpsters and giving and each doing other who's on first it's uh it you're you're always on board with purple rain and and you're right there is the there is the sexist element so maybe that will turn some people off but i, I mean no, i mean i think again that's that's just it's a part the character of the character of prince and that's all you know, it's a large degree of funk music, too. Sure. Like people will come out so quickly and say, oh, rap would be such a great genre, but it has all of these genre-specific problems. Uh huh. So do rock and country and fucking no one, no one calls it out on funk. So I mentioned that Prince got an Academy Award uh, for Purple Rain. And uh, I may have misled you, Eric, because he didn't get it for his acting performance. He got uh, best original film soundtrack aha uh -huh. i was suspicious so we just did dancer in the dark and we've we've all seen rogers and hammerstein's musicals and all these big huge hollywood musicals and nowadays the academy award goes to the soundtrack for war horse because it was done by 
you know, John Williams or, you know, one of the same five guys. And then eventually either Clint Mansell or Trent Reznor will take one. <laughs> right. But great day when, the, when those things happen. I like the notion of seeing an Academy Award nominee list where one of them is Princess Purple Rain. Yeah. Right. Because I don't even see Purple Rain as a film soundtrack. I see the film as a Purple Rain film. Sure. You well, know, it's a companion piece. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the greatest things when you look at why is Purple Rain important. I mean, we had, and this, as far as I know, was not the only time Prince did this. He would have these companion films that kind of sure. went along with albums. Uh -huh. Not knowing as much about Prince as you do, I could only speculate what that must feel like to go Hey, I love this album. Did you know there's a movie yeah. loosely based on? Right. Even if it does, could you just imagine? I mean, that's my biggest fucking want in the whole world is the Year Zero miniseries. Sure, it's a Year Zero movie. Uh -huh. To think about, you know, my top five favorite albums. If bands also created movies that right. went along with them, exactly, that's the greatest idea ever. <laughs> that's I fully agree. Combines, you know, favorite band with my passion of film. Uh -huh. I mean, why doesn't everyone create companion albums? I have for their no idea. Companion movies for their albums. Our website is doublefeatureshow.com. Our email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Seriously, army of me. I want to know if the crazy bits that wind up in the sucker punch version. Are, I feel like I've said this before. Oh, I don't know. When we did Sucker Punch. <laughs> Come on, Bjork people. I know you're listening. Tell me what the fuck is going on. Or email me to let me know that you have no idea, just so I know that anyone still listens to this goddamn show. Uh, producers. That was the other thing I was going to mention. Mm -hmm. Is uh, This episode and half the fucking episodes of the year are brought to you by Kickstarter producers Flint Ironstag, Maxwell Harley, Meta Somerville, and Hannah Hughes. And uh, as a tribute to Kickstarter listeners, we are uh, we're doing one of their crazy movies that they want us to do next time on the show. Oh man, yeah. Next week marks uh, two of what I think are the best films to come out um, since since and including Grindhouse. Wow. We're gonna do the FP and Hobo with a Shotgun in a uh, in a tribute to Canadian exploitation. So uh, let's watch more fucking film. Bye.